everyone. Welcome to Crimson Education. I'm Sam Clark, and I am so excited today in our Crimson Experts interview series to be talking to the founder and CEO of Crimson Education, Jamie Beaton. Jamie, how are you doing? Hey, Sam. Good, good, good. Um, I'm right here in New Zealand. I'm excited to be chatting with you. Looking forward to it. So you, you've been in the education space for, for a few years now with Crimson. Um, what initially got you into the education space and what has changed since you started Crimson in 2013? So what really got me into the education space was that in my last several years of high school, I was going through this college application journey as an international student and I felt like I was um, you know, very keen to get into these great schools and asking lots of people for advice in my community and my school, which was actually quite a high ranked school, but I was receiving lots of advice that was quite um, you know, different, probably what I actually needed to be getting uh, to actually get in. So I chose a lot of quite untraditional strategies, like taking a lot of additional subjects, launching a lot of my own clubs, um, which at the time I wasn't really encouraged to do. And then it really paid off big when I got into all the schools that I had applied for. And so I thought, um, you know, more students could benefit from a more systematic approach to, you know, college guidance. And that started off with, you know, uh, New Zealanders right here in New Zealand before taking it global. And we're now in about 20 countries. So that experience of kind of wanting to bring that uh, knowledge and insights to, to students around the world that are ambitious was really the motivation for getting into education to begin with. Uh, and generally, I just love the space. You know, I've really enjoyed learning since I was little and, um, you know, I still do it as a, as a hobby today um, all the time. So um, there's just been that lifelong passion as well. Absolutely. So when you started, you were really looking to address sort of an information gap, especially for international students applying to American and UK colleges. Um, what has changed in these last seven years? Like what, what needs to be addressed now in terms of students applying to, to top universities? Broadly speaking, it's become a lot more competitive. So uh, the bar has gone up for students. Um, I think many of the schools that our students will regularly apply to have seen big drops in acceptance rates. And um, that means the need for you know, more concrete achievements, whether it be, you know, if you're a science student committing to getting involved in a research that gets published, whether it you know, involve um, you know, demonstrating a social uh, activist campaign that's actually had some significant traction or you know, um, taking a school club to, to many more schools than pro probably previously on the extracurricular side. And then on the academic side, there's a real need to um, not only be able to articulate what your interests are, but have really shown in a lot of detail that you've kind of gone out and, and learned those things. So let's say I like psychology, but my school doesn't offer psychology. Maybe I should be looking at doing AP psychology or maybe like a Stanford summer program in psychology to kind of back that up. Um, as well as things like, you know, um, you know, high quality application essays, etc. So there are some basic trends that have remained consistent, but I think broadly speaking, the stakes have gone up. You mentioned when it came to extracurriculars, the idea of making achievements concrete. What what does that look like? Maybe like with some examples of some students you've worked directly with. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a great one. So I'll give you an example of a student of mine um, from uh, China. So he really is passionate about uh, music, specifically the violin. And, um, you know, he was really interested in how he, he could help younger students get involved in violin at a low cost. Because in China, lots of students have to pay for expensive one-on-one -on -one violin tuition to be able to kind of really advance their interest. And so that kind of really, you know, isolates most Chinese students immediately who can't afford that kind of service. So um, uh, working with him, um, we came up with the idea of a violin tuning device where basically students could, um, you know, uh, string their instrument into this device. And then based on whether the string is too tight or too loose, it would then become um, automatically tuned um, and the device itself was 3D printed um, uh, and could you know, snugly fit onto the pegs of the violin. And there was a speaker and a, and, um, a screen that could then you know, give the person shooting the violin insight into you know, what was going on. And then that whole system was designed by him um, and we filed a patent, et cetera, um, you know, uh, as an example. So that type of end-to-end -end initiative is something that you know, really showcases creative engineering, some entrepreneurial streak, you know, passion for music, and then, you know, all of that coming together is, is very remarkable. Um, you know, a second example that would, you know, come to mind um, would be a project like, you know, Unite for UNICEF, which, you know, came off the back of um, one of our students really enjoyed working with UNICEF, but wanted to kind of raise more awareness for a specific part of it, i.e. the international poverty line. So what she did is she invited along a lot of local um, politicians and a lot of local students and a lot of, you know, parents and media 
and she arranges dinner for which the food was actually prepared on um, less than $1.50 a day, the USD, which was at the time the international poverty line. And that was supposed to kind of symbolize, you know, what you could kind of get for that price. And then um, she was able to, you know, sort of charge quite a market price for the tickets and raise several thousand dollars for um, UNICEF. And um, in doing so, um, got a lot of people that came to that dinner to then go on to create their own UNICEF clubs in their school and kind of spread that program. So that's kind of an example of a kind of more entrepreneurial technical um, project than a more social impact project. Very cool. So now we're obviously at a, a very pivotal time um, in the world, right? But also specifically in education with so many students um, either doing purely online education or uh, hybrid education of some form. What do you envision based on your experience in these last seven years? What do you think the future of education is looking like, um, say in these next five years? So, um... The first thing is I think COVID's led to this uh, acceleration in the adoption of online education by you know, probably five to 10 years. I think, I think it's quite a step change. For example, in China, the penetration of online tutoring services has gone from about 13% to about 70%, um, which you know, represents a huge acceleration. Now, maybe some of that will you know, rewind, um, uh, but um, I think that a lot of this is, is here to stay as many more families have become rapidly acquainted with the benefits of online learning. We always saw at Crimson that once students had tried this and they'd worked with mentors from around the world and they had that experience, they were just so pumped about it, but there was that initial mental barrier to kind of jumping in. And now I think COVID's sort of given everyone exposure to that. So I think that's the first thing you know, that I would call out. As far as some specific trends that um, you know, I will uh, talk about, the first would be, I think, in, you know, increased composition of global universities. And what I mean by this basically is, I'm sitting right here in New Zealand. New Zealand's got a number of local universities. And previously, you know, if you're a New Zealand student, you're only gonna go to one of those schools if you're staying in this country. But now, you know, my options are actually are very international. I could take you know, online undergraduate degrees um, from many countries, online master's degrees from even more countries, and in the future, there's gonna be a global you know, arena for choice. So like a student could sit in say Paris and then take an American degree um, as opposed to having to only have those local options. And what that means is that for a long time, the less resourced national universities are really gonna struggle in competition with more resourced global brands. And there's gonna be more consolidation around some of the top players. In the same way that, for example, Amazon is able to really dominate online shopping, um, big names like Harvard or Stanford can get massive followings online um, and take steam away from these local uh, you know, universities. So I think that's probably net good right for the system because those top schools have got more resources and they've got more expertise. And so it's kind of better if they can touch more students through platforms online. So I think that's kind of like the first trend that I would um, you know, speak to. I think the second trend is that you know, the adoption of online learning um, is uh, growing across the board, including high school. So previously, you know, uh, in America, about 1% of Americans learned in a fully online high school, and they didn't really previously exist outside of the US in big numbers. Um, you know, uh, there've now been a number of, you know, global um, online schools that have been launched, um, you know, most notably, I guess, ours, the Crimson Global Academy, where students can now actually take A-levels and the AP from any of these countries um, in a way they couldn't do before, part-time or full-time. So they could do it alongside their physical school or fully online. So I think the trend of giving students more choice in um, schooling at the high school level to be able to take you know, more subjects or more extracurriculars being part of this global student community as opposed to just a local one is another major trend that you know, we're kind of seeing. Um, I think the third and final point that I just touch on is given that everything is online, there's, there's gonna be increased use of things like um, you know, facial recognition, you know, attention tracking, you know, talk time analysis. So for example, imagine I'm sitting in a school and I get told actually, you're most engaged in economics right now. And you know, recently you've been participating a lot more in those classes than other classes. Um, what, what, the, what might that mean? So some of the automatic data that, you know, we don't subconsciously think about in a physical classroom, it can be made a lot more readily available online that can then prompt learners to kind of make better decisions and then also prompt teachers as well if, if sort of there are interesting trends going on. So I think that that broad kind of data science of education um, space is going to grow quite a bit. So there's three kind of, uh, you know, areas of development that I think are gonna really pick up in the next several years.
Right. Yeah, we recently had a video on the YouTube channel with um, a couple Crimson Global Academy students who talked about sort of how pleasantly shocked they were by the, they weren't shocked by the quality of teachers and how good the teachers were, but they were shocked by the community that was fostered which I think is maybe some of parents' uh, initial hesitance, right? As my kids won't actually be hanging out with other kids at high school. Um, have you observed that, that sort of building of community within students who are all engaged in online learning? Totally, so let's take the example of um, Crimson Global Academy as the first one. Um, the community in that I think is uh, in many ways stronger than what I've seen in physical schools. And I think the reason for that is in the traditional physical school, the motivation of the average student, uh, you know, varies widely, right? But in, in our Crimson Global Academy, you've got, you know, uh, now um, more than a hundred learners from more than 20 countries who come together, you know, uh, sharing this goal to kind of put, use education to push themselves further. So there's that mutual, um, you know, ambition that transcends all the students. And that means there's, there's obviously something in common. And then secondly, there's a fascination there because there are students from Russia, from China, from America, from New Zealand, from Japan, from Costa Rica. And that community is, is very eye-opening because, you know, when you meet kids who are all from your own country, you've kind of seen it before. But, you know, with a global school, there's a really uh, curiosity that comes in. Just like, for example, when, you know, you and I are at Harvard, we meet kids from different parts of the world. That's a really interesting experience. I, I realize now, uh probably should have had this question in earlier, but uh, for those who don't know, for viewers who don't know, could you just give a quick sum up of CGA? The Crimson Global Academy is the world's first global uh, online high school that offers both A-levels, which is the leading British curriculum, which you can use for different universities, as well as the AP or the advanced placement. So students hop into live classes, usually with about eight to 12 students in them um, from around the world. These, are, these classes are streamed based on ability. So you could be a 12-year-old who jumps into an A-level or a 13-year-old you know, jumping into an AP class if your academics kind of meet that level, which means you can go as fast as your potential allows you to go. We don't constrain you based on you know, a certain age or kind of grade level to do what subject, which is very attractive to the high achievers. And then of course, the school's got you know, turbocharged college admissions advice from Crimson. Um, so it's a great um, mixture of uh, support for our students and super relevant during the pandemic. I will wrap this up now actually with our final question, Jamie, this is a big one, but to take us home, um, just general advice that you would have. Like, let's say, let's say 13 year old Jamie was in this situation where we are now in the world. What advice would you give to 13 year old Jamie or to a 13 year old anywhere else in the world in terms of what they should be doing with their education right now? So I think um, at a time like this, there are two reactions people can have. The first reaction is they sort of take the foot off the gas pedal and they um, you know, see this disruption as a reason to kind of lean out of schooling a little bit, go a bit easier, take advantage of the pass fail kind of classes, um, not do any extracurriculars and kind of put their formal education a bit on hold and on, on ice, so to speak. The second category are those students who lean in and they really accelerate. They take advantage of the flexibility that this has created for them. And I would be a huge advocate for the second. And what that really looks like is now, students can take advantage of extracurriculars from around the whole world in a way they couldn't before. Because previously there weren't that many global online activities, but now there is. Take for example, the Tiger Global Case Competition, which has got you know, more than 2000 people competing you know, all over the world. It's a global business competition run by you know, um, a variety of great sponsors. That competition, um, for example, is something you can do from anywhere in the world. Secondly, on the academic side, you know, just recently, the AP exams were fully online. You know, you could sit them in May from anywhere in the world. So there's nothing really stopping you right now from actually going faster in some ways, because with online learning, you know, you cut out the commute time, you cut out a lot of the local frictions and sort of organization around activities. And so if you're really efficient with your time, you can actually get through more, not less. Now, you need to balance that with um, you know, some sports and physical activity, you know, um, some physical meetups as well. So I would really advocate for that. Um, uh, it's been a while now during this pandemic, you know, uh, so I would say that definitely is the course of action I'd recommend. Fantastic, and that's a great note to end on, great advice. Thank you so much, Jamie. I've been Sam Clark and Jamie Beaton with Crimson Education. If you like this video, please click like on it, subscribe to Crimson Education, click the little bell icon so you can get a notification every time we're posting a video. And if you wanna take the first step 
towards working with Crimson, talking with a Crimson expert, going to CGA, anything like that, click the, click the link in the description below, uh, which can set you up on a free consultation with one of the academic experts at Crimson. They can talk to you about CGA, about how you're feeling, about your college aspirations, anything. You might even talk to Jamie, I don't know. It could happen. Thank you, uh, thank you all so much, and we'll catch you next time.